Louise, first off, do you think that dogs at the moment can actually sense that there's something going on? Yeah, I mean, I think that if your dog is part of your family, part of your gang, part of your household, then they do get to, you know, they get to know your ways. They get to understand uh, when you're feeling a little bit sad, a little bit low. So obviously they have no idea about what is going on, but they will sense that uh, perhaps emotions are running high and there are ups and downs. And they will, of course, respond to that as, as you know, as most dogs do. Obviously, at the moment, we can only go out for one one form of exercise a day. So if you've got a dog, that might mean that they're only getting one walk a day. Is that enough? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're in a mold, if you, you know, if there's multiple people in your household, then you can, you know, guidelines say that you can take that, you know, like you could take your dog with you on those walks. So it would go out more. The reality is, is lots of people are just doing one walk a day. And so then it's making sure that that walk counts. So it's obviously going to depend on your dog and it's going to depend on what their kind of motivation is or what are the things that they want to do. So if you've got a dog that is actually a dog that wants to be running and going in the water and all of those kind of things, then obviously trying to access that is really important. What I would say, though, is that for all dogs, whether they're a really fast paced dog, whether you've got an elderly dog, if you've got a dog that is just kind of mid-range, is kind of neither of those. Sniffing is the one thing that all of them will adore doing. And I would say that actually at this time it's a really important thing because it's um, a stress reliever. It helps them. It sort of helps them release anxiety. It's also an amazing thing for them to learn about the world. So I think worst case, try and take your dog somewhere where they can just get a really good sniff. And then what you can do is make sure at home that you are playing games, you are doing stuff. I'm I'm guilty of being a bit impatient with my dog, Audrey, who yeah. loves a sniff. Um, yeah. And I'll be kind of on the lead trying to encourage her to, you know, Move hurry on. up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I shouldn't be doing that then by the sounds of it. Well, I think it's hard. I mean... You know, ordinarily, if we've got places to go and we need to get somewhere, then you don't want them stopping and sniffing at every single thing. And what you don't want to do is create habits that you've then got to change later on. But what I would say is that even if you can't get to a park, there might be, you know, smaller spaces that have got long grass or there might be places that you can access that have got better kind of sniffing facilities is the wrong word. I mean, essentially, it's just things that your dog is going to take an interest in sniffing. Um, and I think it's it's also hard because everyone's got access to different things. So I don't want to put guilt on people and kind of say that you have to do this. At the moment, we've all got to make the best of what we've got available to us. And I think it's just sort of bearing that in mind, really. And what about kind of being engaged with your dog on a walk as well? Because, you know, let's face it, we're all on our phones quite a lot and maybe not paying 100% attention. I guess this is the time to really focus on that walk when you're out. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, the temptation is to listen to something or to make a phone call and your dog will be able to, I mean, my dog can, my kids can, notice as soon as a screen goes in front of our face. And that's usually because our face goes into a bit of a blank expression, whereas dogs are very visual. They go on feedback. So as soon as you kind of disengage with them is when they will start acting up. And it's not because they're trying to be difficult. It's actually just because you are not interacting with them. So you're not giving them direction. You're not letting them know when they're doing something right or what you would prefer them to be doing. So now is definitely the time to, to kind of make that effort and just switch your phone off for that hour that you're going to walk your dog and it will make a huge difference. Yeah, it's probably good for us as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Um, are you letting your dog off the lead at the moment? So I do have him off lead, but I keep him close with me. Um, I'm not sort of allowing him to go up to other people unless, um, you know, randomly we kind of bump into someone or, or you know, you can't help it. Um, but yeah, generally he is off lead. So you're not worried about that interaction with other dogs or anything with, with coronavirus? I mean, it's hard. I've been I've been trying to keep on top of the guidelines. I've been looking at the WHO guidelines. I've been looking at the BVA stuff as well. Generally speaking, it isn't something that people seem to be worried about. So I feel like I feel like there's no concrete information at the moment. So whilst he is allowed to be off a lead, I'm allowing him to. But obviously I am keeping at the distances that they're saying. He's not interacting generally with people. Um, occasionally he's had a little play with a dog that we've sort of, you know, randomly they met each other. 
but generally speaking I'll then call him away and I'm not interacting with that dog so I'm sort of trying to be as sensible as I can and unless that guidance changes I'm sort of following what they've said at the moment. And I guess it's, you know, all about that hand washing, isn't it? When you get home and, you know, yeah, it when is. you've been yeah. handling the lead anyway and those sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. So when you are at home then, it, is it is it difficult for dogs at the moment, do you think? Because potentially they're in a house that's quite full, you know, and they're used to being left on their own. Normally this is a problem if we don't want to leave our, our dogs on their own for too long. Is it a problem that they're with us too much? Yeah, I think you know people need to be careful about creating problems so what we don't want to do is um just to kind of console ourselves or to make ourselves feel better um change the habits and make things more difficult when life does to, you know eventually turn back to normality having said that i would also say that one of the biggest things that people can be looking for is whether their dog is actively seeking out space so if they are removing themselves, if they are, I don't know, hopping off the sofa and going laying on the floor, if they're going to take themselves to their bed, it's trying to make sure that we don't go and scoop them up. We don't call them back to us. We don't try and, and go and sit next to them. That's them saying that they need a little bit of space and that needs to be respected. And that's particularly important if you've got children in the household. Um, but I think at this time, like you say, there is there's generally a lot going on. And I know with my dog, you know, the five and a seven year old were quite a loud household. So I actively encourage him going off and doing something on his own and just getting a little bit of space. So I think you're right. It's just being aware of that and looking out for them and just seeing if that is something that they're looking for. So one thing that I've noticed with, with, you know, she's a chihuahua, she is very territorial normally, but I've noticed that she seems to be even more territorial. So anyone walking past the window, she's barking. It seems a bit of, you know, everyone's at home. So she's trying to kind of protect us. Am I reading too much into that? No, I mean, I think it's a tricky one because it's got a little bit chicken and egg because obviously as long as if we're not there, we don't know their level of barking. However... Um, it is also accurate to say that if we are around more and that we are noticing it more, then it's probably quite likely that it is happening. And I think that it is kind of to be expected. You know, Audrey is of a breed that will alert bark. My dog Pip is the same. He will alert bark when there is someone at the door. You are never going to get rid of that. I think it's just making sure that doesn't escalate. So it doesn't start to become something where they're working themselves into a frenzy or it's kind of getting them into a bit of a state and it and it's sort of raising adrenaline for everyone in the household. Um, I think it's it's trying to make sure as well, though, that if you think that that is something that's happening, is that you are not uh, actively encouraging that. So, for example, um, if your dog is one that barks at the door, not then saying, oh, who's at the door? <laughs> Let, oh who's at the door and then you know the dog's barking and everything's everything's just going up a level and up a level by the time we come out of this your dog is going to be going absolutely crazy about it so with all of these things I think it's being aware that some of these things are going to be expected if they're not getting out as much as they should be if they're not getting rid of some of that energy mm. that kind of extra energy they are going to direct it in other ways and it's not ideal. It's not perfect. So we do have to kind of make the best of a, of a bad situation, basically. How do you stop them from being clingy? Because I noticed the other day, Audrey was outside the, the toilet door. You know, she's, she's like following oh, me to the her. loo and scratching okay. on the door. So how, how do I stop that? Because that seems to be something that's getting worse over the last few weeks. Yeah. So with things like um, clinginess, um, it's really about looking at the things that they're doing, or actually the things that you're doing, or not just you, but in your household. So I noticed with my seven-year-old son that every time Pip, our dog, followed us into a room, my seven-year-old was essentially giving him sort of like a fanfare of clapping, and like, hi, Pippi, hi, hi, hi. It's really cute. But within a couple of days, actually, this had become something where it was becoming consistent. And I sort of picked up on it really quickly and we stopped it now. But if you didn't pick up on that, then you can really quickly within a week have created a behaviour which just starts escalating. So it's trying to make sure that you are not reinforcing the behaviour that you want. So, for example, if she's followed you to the loo door and she's sat outside of it waiting for you, looking like a little chihuahua angel, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you don't want to come out of it and be like, it's all right, Audrey, I'll just go to the loo. Oh, don't no, worry. That is exactly I, me. <laughs> I know, but the thing is, it's what we're doing is essentially saying to them, oh, you did a great job waiting for us. Well done. And so the next time they'll do it. But what will happen is that now she's obviously started scratching at the door. The next bit, which she she'd start whimpering, then it's going to be barking and then it's going to be an escalation of actually being quite distressed. And then we get into territory of leaving doors open and bringing them in and all this kind of stuff. So it's great. You've already picked up on it. You can now start to take it back. And I think it's also kind of going hand in hand with making sure that you are giving her little things to do on her own. So it might be, for example, that you, um, when she goes out to the loo in the garden, say, when she comes back in, you might have just put some little treats on the floor for her to find but you're not going to interact with her and you might not even be in the kitchen when she comes in. So it's like a, it's like an environmental enrichment. You don't need to be there for that. But by her being separate from you, she's still being rewarded without you physically being present. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So kind of if she if she's doing that behavior then and following me somewhere, do I at the moment then just kind of ignore it? I would try and just make sure that when you come out of the loo door. So the ways that a dog will... Um, gain reinforcement of a behavior is if you look at her so if you make eye contact if you touch her and if you vocalize so any of those things probably all three (laughs) exactly so it could be all three or it could just be one so it's really just trying to make sure a little bit like if you live with a partner or you live with kids or whoever it is every time I get up to the loo I don't say to my kids I'm going to the loo or every time I make a cup of tea I don't say to my husband I'm gonna make a cup of tea. well I might do if I'm asking him but generally speaking <laughs> yeah. you don't vocalize that stuff all of the time but yet we do with dogs so I think it's just kind of thinking in your head actually would I tell someone this information no so I don't need to tell you And it's just sort of trying to tone down the amount that we are rewarding that following behaviour if we can. What do we do with dogs to keep them entertained then? Because, you know, we're quite good, aren't we, when when they're puppies to, you know, to train them and spend lots of time with them. We don't really do that so much with adult dogs. Should we be reintroducing that kind of thing and trying to keep them entertained in that way if, if they're not having so many walks? Yeah, I think it's about motive, well, like what motivates your dog. So, for example, if you've got a dog that loves fetch, and that's a really easy thing to be doing around the house and in the garden. If you don't have a dog that likes fetch, then don't bother, don't don't bother putting your energy into trying to teach them that. Use something that they want to play. So, if your dog wants to play tug, if they want to play find it, um, if they want to, you know, the other day with my son, I was teaching Pip to jump over my son in the garden. Because he loves playing with both of us. We were using a ball for that. It's a real confidence boost for him because he's got both of us cheering him on. That was perfect for him. For other dogs that are actually really rambunctious, that would be an awful game because they would get too overexcited. It would be awful with the child. So really look at what your dog likes doing and try and incorporate that into their daily life. And I always say to people, if you if you were to sit down with a pen and paper and make a list of, say, five to ten things that your dog loves doing on a daily basis and you want to use that because if that's what they love doing on a daily basis how are you going to incorporate that so if your dog loves water and actually you live somewhere where you can't access water but you do have a hose pipe or you have a bucket get a bucket put tennis balls in let them go nuts dig out the tennis balls it really doesn't matter but it's about finding what's going to work for your dog and not worrying about what your next door neighbour or what your friend's doing. But it, and even if you just do kind of like three, four, five, five minute sections at a time, that's still better than doing nothing. What about um, if your dog's motivated by food? Because at this time, I think when they're around a lot, there is that temptation to give them lots of treats all the time. You know, you're yeah. feeling like you're going through a hard time. Maybe they are too. And you want to make sure that they're happy. <laughs> How do you yeah. make sure you're not over overdoing it with the treats? So one thing is to make sure that you are only using treats that are um, a natural, you know, like chicken, lamb, that kind of thing. So it's literally just the meat. There's nothing else in there. Another thing is to make sure that if you're, I mean, it depends on your dog. If your dog is prone to putting on weight or is overweight, then obviously you can start to use some of their food allocation. I'm not a massive fan of making a dog work for every single item of food. I do think that they should still have a kind of morning and evening 
meal of some kind uh, but you just might make it smaller so it might be a much smaller portion but actually use some of their food throughout the day I think that I don't if you're worried about them putting on weight then I try and make sure the games that you're playing are active games so their movement it's not just stagnant sitting and you are literally just feeding your dog because obviously that is going to make them put on weight are you at all worried about what happens when um we go back to normal like how you know how are dogs going to cope when they suddenly are left on their own for a bit of time and you know having to having to deal with that normal life yeah I mean I'm still trying I'm still sort of trying to do stuff with Pip where um we leave him downstairs and we all go upstairs to shower get changed get ourselves sorted so that he is still having time on his own obviously he knows that we're in the house and I can't I can't help that I'm not going to sacrifice taking him out to make him stay at home to learn that but I do think it's important to still incorporate some time where they aren't physically with you what I would hope is that the the kind of return to normality is going to be gradual so what I would hope is that people have a bit of a you know a run-up to this it's not going to be extreme but I think if it is something that you're concerned about then now is actually the time to reach out to someone and actually get help rather than waiting until it gets to that point and then you've got a problem that you can't solve because you've got to return to work. Whereas actually at the moment, because people are working from home, they have got the time to put into this. Is now a good time to get a, a, a puppy or a rescue dog? Because obviously people do have more time on their hands. Yeah, I mean, in the States, um, they are... Um, then uh, quite a lot of them have the rehoming centres have actually put a lot of their dogs out into foster care so that those people that are working from home have got company and those dogs are in homes, which in theory sounds great as long as there's no behavioural issues. Um, it's potentially a good option if when we return to normal, whatever that is, your dog isn't going to be left alone for huge chunks of time. I would still never advocate leaving a dog for hours and hours on end. Like, that is no dog's dream scenario. If, however, you are going to be able to work from home or your day, your week is quite fragmented or you're only out for a few hours a day or whatever it is, then yes, it could be because you might have the time to put into it. However, if you are simply thinking it would be nice to have some company and then you're going to go back to work and do epic hours, then no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a good time to get a dog. So it kind of depends on your situation. It is a fantastic time, I think, to, ha to have a dog, isn't it? To, ha to have that companion, because essentially, you know, they, they don't know what's going on and they just want to do all the same things and have fun. Yeah, and I think that with, um, you know, there's so much research about how having a dog um, lowers your um, heart rate in terms of stress. And I think that, you know, through friends and clients that I'm talking to, everyone's having a bit of a hard time. There are definitely ups and downs. And having a dog by your side who just appreciates you, doesn't really care what you look like, has got a lot of love to give you, is really an amazing thing to have at the moment. So I, I definitely count ourselves in the lucky group, yeah. Definitely. All right, Louise, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you so much.